So today we are going to discuss the final beneficial use of water, making energy in the form of electricity. Let us first consider the United States. In our nation as a whole, in the year 2010, 42 percent of our electricity came from burning coal, 25 percent from natural gas, and about 20 percent from nuclear power. Lots of water is needed for these methods of production, mostly for usage in cooling towers, to keep the turbines and boilers from overheating. That water is evaporated as steam to the atmosphere, or released into a nearby lake or river. If you drive by a power plant one day, you might see a white smoke rising from the stack. This is likely steam that is arising from the cooling of the plant using lots of water. If you kayak near a nuclear power plant like I used to do in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you will notice how much warmer the water is downstream of the plant. This is sometimes called thermal pollution. The warmer water cannot hold as much oxygen, so the oxygen for fish and other aquatic animals is decreased, affecting the ecosystem in that warmer zone. So for these three forms of energy production, whether it's burning coal or natural gas or nuclear fission in a power plant, the biggest impacts on water is great volumes of usage for cooling, some of which is turned into steam and lost to the atmosphere, and some of which is returned to the water body downstream, affecting the temperature and the ecosystem of the lake or river to which it is returned. But for many developing countries, including Ethiopia, Costa Rica, Brazil, and parts of China, hydropower is the primary form of electricity production. Dams are built to store massive amounts of water, which is then released through a tunnel in a dam. The force of that flowing water turns a turbine, producing electricity. Since no fuel is burned in the process, this form of production is considered green energy. On the other hand, in terms of loss of water alone, there is much more water lost in evaporation in a hydropower plant than in a coal, gas, or nuclear plant, that is, on the basis of kilowatt hours of electricity generated. The water lost to the atmosphere is carried away to fall as rain on some distant part of the earth or the ocean, and so it represents a regional loss of water. We might add that another form of energy, biofuels made from corn or soybean, also uses much more water to produce one liter of fuel than to produce one liter of gasoline. This is what I think makes the field of environmental engineering and science so interesting. There are so many trade-offs involved in a single environmental decision. One needs to look at the entire picture in order to fully comprehend it. Now, water footprint is a term that is heard much more often nowadays. The water footprint of an individual, a community, or business is defined as the total volume of fresh water that is used to produce the goods and services consumed by the individual or community or produced by the business. Water use is measured in terms of water volumes consumed, whether it's evaporated or incorporated into a product and or polluted over a period of time. You might say it is the impact on water that a particular product represents. And so a water footprint can be calculated for a particular product, for example, for a bottle of Coke or a pair of blue jeans, for any well-defined group of consumers, for example, the state of California, or for a sector of producers, for example, the electricity sector or pulp and paper industry. We have already talked about a water footprint in our opening video when we talked about the amount of water that is used to produce a pound of wheat, that is about 150 gallons of water, versus a pound of beef, about 12 times that much. This gives us a helpful metric in which to compare products and the amount of water usage they represent. So when people talk about the effects of fracking or hydraulic fracturing, a technique used to produce natural gas, they are using terms of water footprint, that is how much water is needed for the fracking process and how much of that water is rendered un unusable or unsafe for other uses because of chemicals mixed with the water to create the fracking fluid. The water footprint can also be helpful as a geographically explicit indicator, showing not only volumes of water use and pollution, but also the locations. In this way, one can predict where the water shortages are likely to occur, and even perhaps where water conflicts might occur. To summarize, water has many beneficial uses in our modern world, in addition to the typical domestic uses of drinking, cooking, and cleaning. 
Many of the products we enjoy, all of the food we eat, and the power we use to make our lives more enjoyable all come as a result of the beneficial uses of water.